Good afternoon, and welcome to the November video presentation. My name is Stephanie Thomas, and today we'll be talking about recent developments affecting compensation analysis. Before we get started, I'd just like to say that I am an economic and statistical consultant and not a lawyer. The information I'll be presenting today should not be construed as legal advice. There are four main events that have impacted the way we study compensation from an equity perspective. The Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, the creation of the National Equal Pay Enforcement Task Force, renewed support for the Paycheck Fairness Act, and most recently, the OFCCP's announcement that the compensation standards and guidelines will be rescinded. So let's take them in chronological order and start with the Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. The Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was the first piece of legislation signed into law by President Obama. Without getting into too much history of the case or the legal arguments surrounding it, the Act reversed a United States Supreme Court decision and essentially reset the clock for filing an equal pay claim each time a paycheck is issued. Before the Act, if someone was going to file a claim of pay discrimination, they had to do so within 180 days of the date of the allegedly discriminatory decision. The Ledbetter Fair Pay Act resets that 180-day period with each new application of a discriminatory compensation decision or other practice, including each time wages, benefits, or other compensation is paid. So what does this mean for employers? There are two main implications. First, there's an increased need for documentation. Under the Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, someone could make a claim of pay discrimination 20 or 30 years after the original decision was made. Most of us would have a hard time remembering the exact details of the compensation decisions we made two or three years ago. So it's important to thoroughly document your compensation decisions, and it's important to retain that documentation. You should keep copies of the metrics and criteria used in evaluating your employee's performance, as well as signed copies of the performance reviews. Any surveys or industry statistics that were used in setting compensation or pay increases should be retained. And finally, because there's essentially no time limit now for bringing a claim, this documentation should be retained indefinitely. For every compensation decision document you destroy, ask yourself which decisions will go unsupported in the event of a discrimination claim. The other implication of the Fair Pay Act is that compensation analysis is now more complex. This is because of two little words contained in the Act, other factors. What are these other factors? They might be pay grade, department, location, shift, or any other factor that creates a seemingly non-discriminatory differential in compensation. To see how this works, let's look at an example. Let's say we're examining the pay rates in pay grade 9 for equity with respect to gender and race. The salaries in this pay grade range from forty to forty-five thousand dollars and there's no evidence of discrimination based on standard statistical analyses. No evidence of discrimination means we're safe, right? Wrong. What if a female employee claims she was hired into the wrong pay grade? What if she claims she should be pay grade 10, but because of discrimination, she was hired into pay grade 9 and is earning less because the salary range for pay grade 9 is less than that of pay grade 10? The other factors aspect of the Ledbetter Fair Pay Act is still a relatively new area and it's not clear what kinds of other factors will be advanced in discrimination claims. It's also not clear how successful these kinds of discrimination claims will be. But the thing to keep in mind is that it's easy to claim you were hired into the wrong pay grade, wrong department, or wrong something. It will be difficult for the employer to demonstrate that the wrong something is really the right something. What all of this means, from a compensation analysis perspective, is that you can't look at compensation in isolation anymore. All of these other factors are in play and are fair game. And keep in mind that any employment decision you make anywhere in your organization is likely to have a compensation component. 
These other factors are going to make it a lot more difficult to assess your compensation system with respect to equity. The next event on our timeline is the creation of the National Equal Pay Enforcement Task Force. The task force is a cross-agency group whose purpose is to crack down on violations of equal pay laws. The task force identified five persistent challenges to the enforcement of equal pay laws. One of these challenges is the government's ability to understand the gender wage gap and to identify and combat wage discrimination. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about the gender wage gap and there's been a lot of statistics thrown around. We could spend all afternoon talking about the gender wage gap, how we're measuring it, what non-discriminatory factors we're controlling for and what effect those factors have, and so forth. But the bottom line is that the government wants more information about the earnings of men and women in the private sector. And they're hoping that this data will allow them to better understand the wage gap and to better target enforcement efforts. And we're going to see that this ties in with one of the other events on our timeline in just a moment. In order to collect this information, the task force is recommending the reinstatement of the Equal Opportunity Survey or a similar instrument. Their hope is that the EO survey will lead to better identification of employers out of compliance and will allow them to narrow the focus of investigations of those employers. They're also recommending industry-wide reviews of compensation practices and believe that the EO survey will help them identify the industries on which they should focus. They're also recommending revamping the EEO reports. After reviewing the EEO reports in their current form, the EEOC has concluded that there's no federal data source that has employer-specific wage data by demographic characteristics for private sector employers. The task force is proposing changes to the EEO reports to collect that information. The task force has also concluded that existing laws don't provide federal officials with adequate tools for combating wage discrimination. To remedy this, the task force is working with the Obama administration and with Congress to pass the Paycheck Fairness Act. This brings us to the third item on our timeline, the Paycheck Fairness Act. Under the Equal Pay Act, employers are prohibited from paying female employees less than their male counterparts for substantially equal work. Employers may be liable for a difference in compensation unless the difference is attributable to a seniority system, a merit system, a system that measures earnings by quantity or quality of production, or any factor other than sex. The Paycheck Fairness Act would amend the Any Factor Other Than Sex defense under the Equal Pay Act. Employers would be required to show that the pay differential is not only caused by something other than sex, but is also related to job performance and is consistent with business necessity. The language of the Act also indicates that this factor other than sex must be a bona fide factor. If passed in its current form, each element factoring into a compensation analysis will need to not only be bona fide and job related, the employer will also have to demonstrate that each element is consistent with business necessity. There's a lot of debate going on about the Paycheck Fairness Act, whether existing laws are enough, whether the Act is trying to correct for a gender pay gap that isn't really as big as people think it is, or maybe doesn't even exist, and whether the Act is finally the piece of legislation that will help us achieve gender pay equity in our society. It remains to be seen whether the Paycheck Fairness Act will actually become law. From a practical perspective, the Paycheck Fairness Act has the potential to revolutionize the way businesses compensate their employees. If passed in its current form, the Act would severely limit the employer's flexibility in accommodating differences in employee compensation demands, past salary history, and pay increases. The fourth and final event on our timeline is the OFCCP's announcement that the compensation standards and guidelines will be rescinded. The standards and guidelines were put into place in June of 2006.
The standards articulated the OFCCP's focus on systemic pay discrimination and outlined their methodology for deciding whether to file an agency lawsuit. The guidelines provided contractors with an outline for a self-evaluation process they could use to avoid investigations. The guidelines centered around regression analysis of similarly situated employee groupings, required employers to follow up on any statistically significant disparities found, and required contemporaneous creation of data and documentation. On August 17th, OFCCP Director Patricia Hsu announced that the compensation standards and guidelines would be rescinded. The recommendation for rescission came from the National Equal Pay Enforcement Task Force. The plan is to replace the standards and guidelines with the new wage data collection tool, which is the revised EO survey or similar instrument that we talked about previously. We don't really know yet what this new wage data collection tool will look like. Some think it will be the old EO survey in a different format. The EO survey was used by the OFCCP from 2000 to 2005, but it was discontinued in 2006 after an independent consulting group found that it was not a valid tool and did not predict systemic discrimination. The new wage data collection tool also ties in with the Paycheck Fairness Act. If passed in its current form, the Paycheck Fairness Act would require 50% of all federal contractor establishments, about 100,000 employers, to complete the EO survey every year. Even if the Paycheck Fairness Act is not signed into law, many think, and I agree, that we will see some form of the EO survey, only now called the Wage Data Collection Tool, and it will be reinstated in some form. So what does all of this mean for compensation analysis? Compensation cannot be analyzed in isolation. Because of the Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, decisions that we typically think of as being non-compensation decisions are now fair game for pay discrimination claims. There's a lot of uncertainty surrounding this aspect of the Fair Pay Act because it's a relatively new area and a new type of claim. To my knowledge, nobody has filed a claim for pay discrimination citing to one of these other factors. But just because we haven't seen it yet doesn't mean it's not coming. It's an easy claim to make, and even if it turns out not to be true, employers will still have to spend time and money defending themselves. Take a holistic approach when looking at and thinking about compensation. And remember, that nearly every employment decision you make likely will have a compensation component. Documentation and retention of compensation decision information is critical. I'm sure you've all heard it a million times. Document, document, document. But documentation isn't just a best practice strategy. Because of the Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, compensation decisions made five years ago, ten years ago, or even 20 years ago can now be challenged. Documentation is essential. You're not going to remember the exact details of how every single compensation decision was made. Document it and retain it so you can access it if you need it. If you're not statistically examining your compensation practices, you should be, because someone else will be. The government is planning on collecting compensation data by demographic characteristics from private sector employees. You can guarantee they're not going to shelve that data. They're going to be looking at it and studying it statistically. It's important to know what story can be told by your compensation data. And the best way to find out is to statistically examine it. Not only will this help you prepare for what the government may find when they analyze your data, it will provide you with an opportunity to identify potential problem areas and give you a chance to take corrective action where appropriate. Federal contractors and subcontractors might be on their own for a while. At the urging of the National Equal Pay Enforcement Task Force, the OFCCP has announced that the compensation standards and guidelines will be rescinded. We don't know when this rescission will officially take place, but we do know that it's likely to happen in the near future. It's not clear whether the OFCCP will continue to allow contractors to use the voluntary self-evaluation as a means to avoid investigations.
It's also not clear whether the analysis method outlined in the guidelines will still be accepted by the OFCCP. My guess is that after rescission, employers will no longer be able to self-evaluate as an alternative to producing their data to the OFCCP. Given the emphasis on wage data collection, I think that the government agencies are going to want every scrap of data they can get a hold of, and it's unlikely that they will bypass contractors who do self-evaluate. But again, this is speculation on my part. We don't yet know how this is going to play out. Employers who are self-evaluating their compensation decisions should continue to do so. Even if it won't get you out of an OFCCP investigation, it's important to know where your potential problems are and what story can be told by your compensation data. I also think that if your self-evaluation system is based on the outline provided in the guidelines, you should stick to that methodology even after the guidelines are rescinded. The method outlined in the guidelines makes sense. Constructing similarly situated employee groupings is a logical way to group employees for comparison purposes. The use of formal statistical analysis, and particularly the use of multiple regression techniques, is tried and true. Multiple regression analysis is a generally accepted methodology within the scientific community and has stood up to scrutiny from the legal system. It's the preferred method for analyzing compensation systems with respect to equity. Investigating any statistically significant differentials also makes sense. There's really no point in doing the self-evaluation unless you can learn something from it. By looking at those statistically significant disparities, you may uncover an important factor in the way you determine compensation that's been left out of the model. You may also learn that there are some areas in which corrective action may be required. The method presented in the guidelines makes sense, and there's no reason to abandon that method after the guidelines are rescinded. The other way in which contractors and subcontractors may be on their own is with respect to the OFCCP's methodology and how they will determine whether to file an agency lawsuit. Without the standards in place, Employers will have no information about the methodology being used by the OFCCP. It's likely that some kind of replacement will be issued, and they will give contractors information about their methodology. But it's not clear how long this will take, and it's not clear whether the new information will provide enough detail for contractors to really understand what the OFCCP is doing. Time will tell, and we'll have to wait and see. We'll also have to wait and see on the Paycheck Fairness Act. It's a huge wild card, and it's too soon to know for sure whether there will be any substantial changes made in the language or intent of the Act, or whether the Act will be enacted into law. The only thing we do know right now is that if it's enacted in its current form, it will severely limit employers' flexibility and will revolutionize the way businesses compensate their employees.